pandemic has hit our societies tremendously and I'm sure that the topic will be uh, discussed later today in our panel and during the breakout groups. And to be honest with you, we have doubted on whether we should go ahead with this event today, um, but felt that in light of the forthcoming EU India Council, the summit uh, on Saturday, and the increasing interest in pursuing the free trade agreement between the EU and uh, India, that it is important to make the animal voices heard but also to, um, to discuss and exchange on how we can learn the lessons of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and find ways to prevent future pandemics. So I'm handing over to Varda now. Um, thank you so much for your kind words, Reineke. Um, so I recently came across an uh, anonymous statement, uh, death is only a number till it is one of your own. Uh, and that's a strong quote that holds so true in the turbulent times that we are living in with the pandemic and its impact on human and non-human animals. Besides the huge amounts of loss of lives, this pandemic has forced us to introspect on what could have been avoided and done differently. It has also brought to the forefront burning issues, one of which is the way we treat ourselves and our fellow human beings and the Earth. It's not to be sidelined that improving animal welfare will play a crucial role in building back more sustainable and resilient societies. At PIAPO, our vision is recognition and respect for animal rights in society and a high-impact, well-connected movement that serves the cause of the greater good, both for human and non-human animals. This has encouraged us to find solutions jointly beyond borders and leave the me behind for the we. The world is facing an unprecedented number of challenges that can only be resolved through international cooperation. This is exactly why we have got together today. The EU and India entered into a strategic partnership in 2004 and both sides started negotiations towards a comprehensive FTA in 2007. However, these have not been materialized due to multiple reasons. Now, at the eve of the 16th EU-India summit, there has never been a better time than to discuss animal welfare in the context of EU-India trade relations. The future EU-India FTA will be at the center of discussions, and this agreement, according to the new EU trade strategy, should contain a chapter on sustainable food systems, including provisions on animal welfare. In addition, at the last EU-India summit in July 2020, leaders also endorsed a new EU-India strategic partnership for 2020 to 2025, in which they agreed to promote cooperation on issues like climate change, biodiversity laws, uh, loss, antimicrobial resistance, but also on strength strengthening sustainable food systems and on developing sustainable aquaculture. Such a wording clearly calls for the inclusion of animal welfare in the EU-India agenda. Also, improving animal welfare is strongly linked to the achieving of the UN SDGs, another political goal supported by both the EU and India. Our event today will start by a high-level panel discussion exploring the scope for the EU and India to collaborate on animal welfare, and then we'll split into breakout rooms to discuss more concrete opportunities to cooperate around fish, poultry, and dairy welfare. Our objective is to come up with recommendations on how the EU and India can cooperate on the subject of animal welfare and within the context of trade dialogue and positively impact food systems ahead of the restart of trade negotiations. But before I share with you a few housekeeping rules and information, uh, as Stephanie shared, if, uh, if your name on uh, Zoom, once you're entering this platform is incorrect, please do uh, feel free to correct it. Uh, second, there is no translation. Uh, so any uh, who wish to intervene, please, you're invited to speak in English. Uh, please keep yourself muted during the meeting. Please add your questions using the Q&A function and they will be addressed at the end of the session. And this meeting will be recorded. The video recording and presentations will be sent to all participants afterwards. Now, I'm very pleased to start our event with an introductory message from, from Maria Dosao and Tunish, Minister of Agriculture of Portugal, who currently holds the presidency of the Council of the EU.
É com gosto que me encontro uh, neste evento tão oportuno sobre o bem-estar animal, promovido pela Federação das Organizações Indianas de Proteção dos Animais e pelo Eurogrupo for Animals. Quero felicitar as duas entidades pelo trabalho que têm vindo a desenvolver e por juntarem neste mesmo painel um, perspectivas pertinentes, diferentes, trazidas pelos intervenientes que cumprimento e que estou certa vão permitir um debate enriquecedor e muito profícuo. A Índia é um país com laços históricos fortíssimos a Portugal. Temos assistido ao longo das últimas décadas ao seu enorme crescimento económico, social e cultural e acreditamos que será um dos mercados mais importantes do futuro. E estamos também convictos de que vai continuar a ser um dos parceiros de excelência da União Europeia. E quanto ao bem-estar animal, tema que nos traz hoje aqui, devo dizer que este tema é de crucial importância para a União Europeia e, consequentemente, para a presidência portuguesa, estando uh, refletido no Tratado sobre o Funcionamento da União Europeia, que reconhece os animais como seres sensíveis. Conscientes de que o bem-estar animal é parte integrante da manutenção da sustentabilidade na produção animal e nos sistemas alimentares, a União Europeia tem tido um papel cada vez mais ativo nesta matéria. É necessário aprofundar o tema do bem-estar, o qual deve ser pensado numa abordagem integrada e interdisciplinar tal qual está previsto no conceito a uma só saúde, o qual enquadra a garantia da saúde humana, da saúde animal, da fitossanidade e da saúde ambiental numa perspectiva holística sobre os ecossistemas a várias escalas. E porque devemos discutir o bem-estar animal no contexto das relações comerciais, porque sabemos que só assegurando o bem-estar animal Será possível garantir uma produção eficiente, uma boa saúde animal e humana, bem como fluxos comerciais sustentáveis. A pandemia que marca os tempos que vivemos é o melhor exemplo para ilustrar a urgência de refletirmos sobre a necessidade de assegurarmos coerência entre as políticas ambientais, alimentares e comerciais. Por este motivo, a União Europeia anunciou, na sua nova revisão da política comercial, a necessidade não só de enquadrar os ensinamentos da Covid-19, com a intenção de propor a inclusão de aspectos sobre sistemas alimentares sustentáveis em todos os novos acordos de comércio livre. Estes aspectos irão incluir disposições sobre bem-estar animal, Sendo importante começar a discutir o tema de forma a poder construir pontos e equilíbrios procurando agilizar a abordagem futura em relação às questões comerciais. A sustentabilidade é também um dos pilares da parceria estratégica entre a União Europeia e a Índia 2025, a qual apela à promoção da cooperação no reforço da sustentabilidade nos sistemas alimentares e na agricultura. Estamos, portanto, muito alinhados. Trabalhamos em conjunto para promover melhorias no bem-estar animal. É fundamental para encontrar soluções para os desafios globais que enfrentamos, tais quais as alterações climáticas, a resistência aos antimicrobianos ou a propagação de doenças. O contexto em que vivemos é de grandes desafios, mas também de oportunidades. A nível europeu, temos a ambição de criar sistemas alimentares mais sustentáveis, mais inovadores, mais justos e que garantam as melhores condições a todas e a todos os agentes da cadeia alimentar, não esquecendo as motivações e as convicções dos consumidores. Mas o sucesso vai depender sempre de um diálogo permanente e da estreita cooperação como aquela que hoje aqui se demonstra. O reforço do bem-estar animal é uma meta que não se esgota. E por isso temos de continuar a trabalhar por respostas cada vez mais eficazes, sem fronteiras e que a todas e a todos dizem respeito. Espero que as relações entre a União Europeia e a Índia sejam cada vez mais robustas, 
um, da cimeira do próximo sábado para podermos construir uh, ou continuar a construir também o nosso futuro coletivo, esperamos o melhor. A dimensão do bem-estar animal tem questões éticas, mas tem questões de saúde pública que importa serem refletidas também neste domínio. Muito obrigada a todos, um bom trabalho. Thank you, uh, Minister Dussel Antunes, and it is great, great to hear the support from the Portuguese presidency uh, for incorporating animal welfare within the context of sustainable development in the EU-India trade talks, and to start collaborating on this topic and start building bridges as we are doing uh, today. Um, this event is also the occasion for you for animals to launch a new report on animal welfare in the context of uh, trade, uh, but also really zooming in on the issues um, on animal welfare in India and the EU. And I would like to warmly thank uh, FIAPO, Animal Equality India, HSI India, and Mercy for Animals India for their contributions to it. A lot of research went into it. So I hope you will all read it after today's uh, event. But we prepared a short video uh, for you to really get a summary and overview of the topics in the report, which will also inspire our panel debate uh, afterwards. So, Steph, can I ask you to show us this uh, video? The EU and India have been discussing a comprehensive trade agreement for almost 15 years. And one of the main stumbling blocks remains the inclusion of provisions on trade and sustainable development. In the meantime, the political context is rapidly changing. The EU has launched its European Green Deal and a new trade strategy. In addition, the world is facing an increasing number of challenges that can only be resolved through international cooperation. And at the heart of these challenges often lies the food system and animal welfare. Improving animal welfare will play a crucial role in building back more sustainable and resilient societies. The COVID-19 crisis has painfully highlighted the detrimental impact of economic and trade policies that prioritize profits above all. Global markets and further unconditional trade liberalization has tended to favor bigger companies. In the dairy and meat sector, this led to increased integration and intensification. Promoting animal welfare through trade policy, including in EU-India negotiations, would thus contribute to lessen the risks of future pandemics. It would also help fight the rise of antimicrobial resistance and contribute to solve the climate and biodiversity crises. What about animal welfare in India and in the EU? India has a long history addressing animal welfare, with its constitution mandating all citizens to have compassion for living creatures and its anti-cruelty law dating back to 1960. Yet, there is a lack of regulation of the rearing of farmed animals and concerns about enforcement. Over the past decades, India has become one of the global leaders in the production of hen eggs, buffalo, goat and cow milks, as well as buffalo, goat, sheep and chicken meats. 78% of Indian citizens consider the government should make stronger laws so that animals used for food are not tortured. The EU has a history of caring too, including a recognition of animal sentience in its treaties a decade ago. But it's also one of the biggest players on the agri-food market. The EU describes itself as a leader on animal welfare and has several legislation in place, but for the past decade, no progress has been made. With the EU Farm to Fork strategy and the coming revision of EU animal welfare standards, progress are finally in sight. In 2019, one out of seven EU citizens said they wanted animal welfare to be an EU priority. What could the EU and India do? They could cooperate on sectors like broiler chickens and laying hens. Why? because of the importance of these sectors for both partners. Both could also discuss dairy cows and cattle. The EU imports by-products of these sectors 
Also, both the EU and India lack species-specific rules in the field. The EU and India could also cooperate on fish welfare. The EU imports a fair quantity of Indian farmed fish and shrimps, but also the aquaculture sector is a growing one, both in India and the EU. As the EU has now decided to include chapters on sustainable food systems in all its future trade agreements, including the one with India, and as animal welfare provisions will be part of such a chapter, it's time to build bridges to prepare the negotiations by establishing a cooperation mechanism on animal welfare. I hope you found it an interesting uh, introduction and uh, please check out the report um, and the link will be shared uh, in the chat box and do uh, share with us your feedback afterwards. Um, we are now moving on uh, to the panel debate which will last till about 11 o'clock and then we will go to the breakout groups. So we will hear from our honored guests, uh, seven panelists, uh, what they think about the topics uh, just presented. Um, and I will introduce them all and ask them an opening question. And then I would like uh, to invite you all to uh, put your questions in the chat box and uh, Varda will pick them up and we will come back to them uh, once we have introduced all our guests. Um, and I would like to uh, ask our panelists uh, to speak a bit slowly because um, not everyone is a native speaker uh, today. So first, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, you to Dr. Ashok who is the Assistant Director General for Animal Health at the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And uh, Dr. Ashok, uh, your professional journey has been a stellar amalgamation of two fields, uh, veterinary sciences and public health care. And both these domains are strongly interconnected, as we have also just seen in the videos, and they are also symbiotic uh, in nature. Now, the EU is moving ahead with improving its animal welfare standards in the context of the Green Deal. Um, is that a trend you think India would like to follow? Um, and would there be a willingness to exchange and, and share experiences on this topic? Um, Dr. Ashok, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you, uh, Renike. Uh, a very good morning to everyone again. Uh, actually, uh, if we see the socio-cultural heritage of India uh, with good backup of the present day legislation, uh, one will find that uh, culturally the Indians have been uh, taught to respect the animals. But actually this is uh, uh, during the present time and when we see the future, we see the increasing human population, which is estimated to reach 9.1 billion in 2050, with most of the growth occurring in developing countries. And uh, if we analyze, we will find that particularly in developing countries, meat consumption has grown at over 5% per annum during recent decades, and milk consumption at nearly 4% per annum. So uh, this uh, pressure on production system, it has made a global shift from traditional low density pastoral farming to high density intensive farming. And uh, particularly when uh, we are going towards intensive farming, this economy, actually what people want that they want uh, to economize the production system to reduce the cost of production. And uh, to me, I feel that this is the region uh, which made the people to compromise the animal welfare aspects. So we have to see, uh, you have correctly said that in, uh, if we see that uh, how we can collaborate with EU uh, uh, regarding animal welfare, uh, we can find out that uh, our priority area should be awareness and implementation of standards for good management practices. To enhance comfort and productivity in dairy farms with exchange of the latest know-how on prevention and control of diseases. Because we have to make our farmers to understand 
that only with animal good animal welfare we can go for higher production it uh, if we will be compromising the animal welfare system it will not be possible to go for the healthy production system uh, we will not be able to maintain the healthy animals which will create the problems like amr and others thank you uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ashok, for this very spot on analysis. And I would like to hear more from you later also about how you see uh, animal welfare and productivity go going together. And if you see scope in India also to um, uh, enhance uh, animal welfare regulations. Um, but now we move to our next uh, panelist, uh, Manuela Ripa. And Manuela is a German member of the European Parliament, um, where she sits for the Greens EFA group uh, as a substitute on the International Trade Committee. And in this capacity, she's a member of the Delegation for Relations with India. Uh, Manuela, from an European Parliament perspective, how important is it to deliver sustainability, including animal welfare, through trade policy? And can you tell us a bit more about how the Parliament has moved on this recently? Manuela, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me. Um, first of all, I would like to express my deepest regret for the severe deterioration of the pandemic in your country, India. It is an absolute tragedy. Europe has shown solidarity, and we have to go on showing it. The global dimension of the pandemic is undeniable, and we're not safe until everybody is safe. Coming back to your question, Reinke. I believe that not only since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, delivering sustainability through trade policy must be the new dogma. This is especially true for animal welfare. Mainly of our most pressing global issues are stemming from weak animal welfare standards. This includes the climate crisis, biodiversity loss, antimicrobial resistance and the spread of zoonoses. Let us not forget COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. The pandemic has shown how severe the effects of habitat destruction and poor animal welfare can be and how closely intertwined human health and animal welfare are. At the moment at the EU level and especially in the parliament, we are discussing a new, a renewed EU trade policy after COVID-19 pandemic. And we are at historical momentum so for a substantial change. And I will underline it um, while repeating it. As with the Paris Agreement, we have to globally reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. The impact of the pandemic could set the ground for a systemic change. And the WTO crisis is in its biggest crisis, which is a good basis for new rules echoing urgent needs of climate and animal protection. And not to forget, unconditional trade liberalization fostered intensification of animal agriculture, which is detrimental to animal welfare. And maybe not everybody realizes this, but this is also detrimental to our health. Industrial animal farming uses too many antibiotics which cause antimicrobial resistance in humans. So the next pandemic coming from zoonosis is right in front of us. Not only India has an overuse problem of antibiotics, more so China and the US, also the Europeans, even if not to that extent. It is scientifically proven that improving farm animal welfare will reduce the need to rely on antibiotics. On climate, the livestock supply chain emits an enormous amount of greenhouse gas emissions. To cut it short, our trade policy needs also to contribute to make our society more resilient by better addressing animal welfare. As you were asking how the parliament is moving on this, the European parliament has recently sent a very strong signal. We oppose the EU Mercosur free trade agreement. I must say that I'm proud of the parliament to have assumed a strong stance here. And it is indeed possible to make trade agreements more sustainable. The free trade agreement negotiations with New Zealand can be a first chance to make TSD chapters enforceable and part of the overarching settlement system. The EU should not lose this opportunity. And also the EU-India trade negotiations need to have strong TSD chapters. 
under no circumstance should it lead to the simulation of industrial animal agriculture. I'm happy to see that like in the EU, most of Indians residents are aware of these issues and generally supportive of high animal welfare standards. But a lot of work remains to be done and we can't sideline animal welfare and free trade agreements anymore. In all policy areas, the EU needs to act in the spirit of the Green Deal, also and especially in its trade policy. Concretely, the EU and India should discuss how to improve the living conditions of animals like laying hens, broilers, kettle, cows and fish, or the handling, transport and slaughter of buffalo, goats and sheep. Talks between the EU and India, like for the EU-India strategic partnership, have moved a little bit in that direction, which is a first step. So to come to an end, I call on the EU-India summit on May the 8th to use this momentum and to build a new form of trade relationship based on common values. Let's be a global role model for sustainable trade in which human rights, the protection of the environment, and animal welfare are equally important as economic interests. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Manuela, for your uh, very passionate uh, speech and your strong uh, and, and relevant call uh, to the um, EU-India uh, uh, summit. Um, we would like to hear a bit more from you later on about how this could also materialize. Uh, um, but now, uh, Dr. Vijay, I would like to turn to you. Uh, Dr. Vijay is Joint Director of the Food Safety and Standard Authority in India. Uh, so, Dr. Vijay, uh, we said already uh, that the EU-India India strategic partnership um, includes that the EU and India will promote cooperation on strengthening sustainable food systems and also developing sustainable agriculture. So, how do you think should both partners implement these words and also avoid that this will just remain a dead letter? And do you think that animal pet welfare should have a place in this? Dr. Vijay, I would like you to take the floor. Thank you, Reneke, for the opportunity and thank you, FIAP India, for giving me the opportunity. So first of all, I would like to say, I really like the idea that you are saying the planting the seeds of animal welfare in India, EU trade. That's very, very important. And it is not simply by planting the seeds. We have to also protect this. We also let it grow it as a tree. Otherwise, the animal welfare is most of the time is being sidelined. Coming to your two points that you have made, uh, I would like to emphasize, Reneke, on this is that sustainable. Animal welfare, sustainability, one health, and the issues like AMR and issues like genosis is very, very critically important. I would like to give you an example that India is also Lada fourth largest consumer of antibiotic and a lot is going into the animal sector. Until, unless we have the welfare standard, which have a direct consequence on reduction of antibiotic uses, we cannot have the think of one health, we cannot think of the sustainability. As been pointed out by Dr. Sokumar sir, that we have gone from the farming, which is very, I mean, a separated one to the very intense farming because we want to make production increase. And in that process, animal welfare is being compromised and antibiotics are used a lot. So it is very good idea to make a connection between these two. Now coming to the second thing, as have been pointed out by Manuela about the genetic disease and COVID is also genetic. Think that if this COVID would have been coming from the poultry, what would have we done to the poultry? Would have just removed them all those from this earth. But since it is not spreading from humans to humans, we cannot do this. So it is important now that we should understand that how these diseases are coming up and why should and how can we stop their spread coming to the human? Like if you see the wet market, if you see our slaughterhouses, how are they being done and how they are means, uh, means not being regulated much. If one animal is slaughtered in presence of another and the mixing of this um, secretion of these animal goes on, then there is every possibility of jumping of viruses and disease from one species to another species. So I would like to say the sustainable Sustainability and seed have to be put into EU-India trade partnership 
and we are doing a lot. We are very good in regulation and we are now enforcing regulation also. I can cite some example where government of India is now revising the prevention of cruelty to animal act 1960, where we want, because it was done very late, now we want to be modify and make up to international standard. Many things are happening. So I would like to emphasize at last, the animal welfare cannot work in silos, cannot work all alone. AMR is directly related, genetic disease directly related, biodiversity is directly related. So it is important to match and marry these idea into one health concept and consider animal welfare is very, very important component. Then only we can think of sustainability and one health. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vijay. This was uh, thought provoking what would have happened if COVID and 19 uh, was born in poultry farming. Uh, food for thought, but let us by all means try to avoid the next uh, pandemic. Um, and your analysis on the interrelationship between all these uh, issues is also uh, very striking. So we hope to come back to you on that uh, later on. Um, our next panelist is Professor Linda Keeling, and she's a professor on animal welfare at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. Um, Professor Keeling, um, your work studying the connections between animal welfare and the sustainable development goals is an excellent reference for us because we have always wondered why animal welfare has not uh, been a more explicit part of the 17 uh, goals. And for starters, I would like to ask you, could you talk a bit uh, about the link between animal welfare and, and public health? And it was already referred to this one health uh, concept. And how do you see the benefits for livestock producers also to, to embrace this and to think more about this relationship? Linda. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, yes, uh, when it comes to public health, uh, it is zoonoses that most people think about. And we've already heard comments on that, that animals with poor welfare, there's an increase of shedding, uh, they have a reduced uh, immune system, which leads to the increase of transmission of this. So that leads then to more use of antibiotics and to the antimicrobial resistance debate that we are discussing now. So several people have taken up that and I can only support that and say, we really have to deal with this. But when we think about public health, I want to bring it broader than only infectious diseases. Uh, there's the clinical health aspect in our relationships with animals, um, especially when we think about working animals and our relationships with animals and the farm. Accidents happen, there are injuries, especially when you're working together very closely with animals. Um, as I say, these can be injuries, but they can also be wear and tear injuries by the interaction of the person and the animal and the, the division of work between this. So I want to lift up the, the physical health bit, although I, while acknowledging the infectious disease is very important not to forget that. And then there's even a third part, because if we think about uh, health, it's not only physical health, it's also the mental health and uh, means stress, Fear. These are actually mental states in us and animals. So uh, if you have animals that are frightened, then that also affects their immune system, makes them more uh, susceptible to diseases. And if we think on both sides of the relationship, the human animal relationship, then we affect each other directly and, and indirectly. I think that this is, um, I mean, our relationships with animals affect us both positively and negatively, we look at these. So this with the one health, if you think of it as again, not only the infectious diseases, it's the physical and the mental part. And that was already mentioned and, and you mentioned it in your question. But then we can go further out, appreciate the complexity of this area that we're in and think that there's the concept of one welfare also, where we, including in and lifting up this interrelationship. So it builds on the one health concept, but brings in these other aspects. Uh, just linking to that, you, you mentioned already the sustainable development goals. And uh, I have been working in this area and hope to continue. I mean, we're talking about sustainable food systems, but they have to be in this uh, uh, part of this sustainable global development. 
So if we put these ones that we're discussing now, you can think that the One Health seems to fit very clearly in our SDG three, the Sustainable Development Goal number three, which is for good health and welfare. But when we broaden this and we start to think about the many different interactions we have with animals and how our farming systems interact with wildlife and with biodiversity, how that can affect our working environment, um, tourism of people going to look at animals and how we can have this sustainable farming systems uh, going uh, and fitting together with the uh, biodiversity and the wildlife, then we start to see that all these things are interlinked. So. I will finish on that uh, broader note. So thank you for the question on public health, but I managed to, to bring it out into uh, the whole area here of sustainable development. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Linda. And, and you know, there's so much more um, to say on, on this. I, ho I hope we have time to zoom in a bit more uh, on uh, One Welfare and how it relates to uh, One Health, uh, but also um, the uh, uh, interconnectedness between the Sustainable Development Goals and, and Animal Welfare. And I could recommend everyone uh, to read uh, your article. Um, now, um, we also have with us today, Dr. Uh, Yoshi, who is the Joint Director for Animal Welfare in the Department of Animal Husbandry of the Government of Utrecht. And he is also the officer in charge at the Utrecht Animal Welfare Board. Dr. Uh, Yoshi, uh, balance is imperative in life, as we know. Um, how, based on your vast experience, can balance be struck between the need to ensure animal welfare and the commercial imperatives? And is that even possible? Uh, Dr. Yoshi, I would like to give you the floor. Hello, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Uh, thank you very much to provide me opportunity to share my inputs on this platform. Uh, our India is a vast country. It has 28 states and eight union territories. Being an officer of a state government of government of Uttarakhand, I'll share my inputs uh, with regards to perception of the state government uh, on animal welfare, particularly on poultry welfare. Uh, we consider poultry welfare to have uh, basically three, three branches. First branch is about transport of poultry. For that, we already have a transport of animals amendment rule 2001 framed under Prevention of Cruelty and Animals Act 1960. And as per the, uh, that rule, uh, we have got legal provisions regarding uh, dealing with the transport of the poultry birds. In poultry welfare, definitely uh, when we talk about the boiler welfare, we find killing and culling of the day-old chicks. Uh, in that regards, I would like to share that in ovo sexing technology is still new to our country. It has still to reach in the field level. And as and when we get this in ovo sexing technology, uh, definitely we shall be able to achieve our target to avoid this cruelty. Uh, then the third, that is about the layer housing. Uh, in in the year 2012, for the first time uh, in my life, I heard about the uh, battery cage policy of the European Union and we got these advisories from Animal Welfare Board of India in the month of February 2012 and again in the month of June 2012. In the July 2012, uh, our state government called a stakeholder, stakeholders meeting where the poultry industry people were called, animal people were called, and officers of state government were sitting there. And listening the point of view of all the people, uh, government of Uttarakhand decided that uh, we should make appeal to the poultry farmers that they should try to wave off, try to stop this uh, poultry housing system, that is the battery case system of poultry housing, and we should make an appeal because uh, since we don't have the authority to make rules under the Pre Prevention of Cruelty Act 1960, that is a central act under the concurrent list. Only government of India, Union government has that authority to frame the rules under the uh, act. So we requested to government of India to please frame a rule so that we have a uniform law of the land across the country and we can implement it. Then later on in the year 2013, in November, uh, our uh, FRDC, Special Secretary and uh, Special Secretary of Forest and Rural Development, C. 
uh, gave us the directions that we have to appeal and we have to enforce and we have to guide the poultry farmers. They should not uh, approach, they should not adopt the system of uh, battery system of poultry housing. And when these orders were passed, but we were not able to implement it because we were not having the law of the land designed by the Union government. Uh, we got one advisory from Government of India as well in the year 2016. And in the year 2016, Government of India, they again called a stakeholders meeting where even our FIAPO was also one of the um, partners who attended that meeting at the level of Government of India, Ministry of Environment and Forest, Government of India. And still it was uh, under consideration of how the law of the land should be designed regarding the poultry housing. In the year 2012, uh, 2018, we got landmark verdict from our Uttarakhand High Court, that is in Nanital, that uh, we have to stop this battery case system of poultry housing in our state. And obviously the Poultry Farmers Association, they filed SLP against the orders of Honorable High Court uh, in the Supreme Court of India. And in the year 2018, Supreme Court passed and stay orders because already the same sort of controversy, same sort of debate was happening in other states also, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, in the state of uh, Maharashtra, in the state of Karnataka, in the state of, state of Punjab, and all those high court cases were transferred to Delhi High Court as per the orders of Honorable Supreme Court. So our this writ is still under process at the level of Supreme Court, where the order of High Court of Uttarakhand has been challenged in the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, then in 2017, we got a wonderful um, advisory from our Law Commission of India, where all the stakeholders were called. Uh, that uh, the, uh, And our Law Commission of India has recommended that we must have the poultry housing rules. And uh, the Law Commission of India has recommended for the five sorts of, uh, sorts of freedom for animals that has been and draws in the uh, orders of Honorable Supreme Court of India, that is Animal Welfare Board of India versus A. Nagaraja, that is said to be Magna Carta of Animal Welfare in our country, where Honorable Supreme Court has endorsed that, that, that all the animals must be provided freedom from hunger, thirst, and malnutrition. They must be provided freedom from fear and distress. They must be provided freedom from physical and thermal discomfort. They must be provided freedom from pain, injury, and disease. And they must be provided freedom to express their natural behavior that has been endorsed by our Supreme Court of India. And considering these directions from Honorable Supreme Court, Law Commission of India has recommended to include these things, consider these things uh, in the law of the land. And uh, Animal Husbandry uh, Ministry, Government of India, initially it was uh, under Agriculture Ministry of Government of India. Now, recently new ministry has been formed at the level of Union Government. The Animal Husbandry Ministry has designed draft rules for layer housing. And those draft rules are, have been marked to all the state governments to share the comments. So that is already uh, in the pipeline. And uh, since you are talking about the biodiversity, uh, this is definitely present to share that uh, already a case has been filed in National Green Tribunal, NGT. And NGT passed a, a, a landmark order in the year 2020, September 2020, where NGT has given orders that the uh, in the line of the compliance of the Environment Protection Act, Water Pollution uh, uh, Prevention and Control Act, and Air Pollution Prevention and Control Act, uh, all the poultry farm poultry farms must be covered. All the poultry farms above the capacity of uh, more than 5,000 birds, they must be covered. Uh, under the, these, uh, these three legal provisions and the Central Pollution Control Board must design guidelines uh, so that uh, we can uh, take care of the environment protection, we can take care of water, uh, uh, water pollution and we can take care of the uh, air pollution. So uh, by December 2020, Central Pollution Control Board under Ministry of Environment and Forest Government of India was supposed to design the guidelines for all the poultry farms. And it has been um, uh, mentioned in the order of Honorable NGT uh, that if CPCB Central Pollution Control Board fails to design the guidelines, by December 2020, then from 1st January 2021, the consent to establish and consent to operate 
provisions under the uh, Environment Protection Act and Air Pollution Act shall be implemented or on the poultry farms across the country. Thank you, thank you, so Dr. Already, Yoshi. Already, haan, to already mm, all the state and welfare board they have to implement it. It is in the pipeline and guidelines by CPCB are in the pipeline. That yeah. is yes. thank you very much. This is all about the poultry value. Thank, thank you very you. much. In, in my perception. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Uh, Yoshi. And it is very promising to hear that so much is in the pipeline. And, and as you said, I think the EU and India could learn a lot from each other because the EU is now considering uh, phasing out uh, cage systems uh, in, in the entire livestock production. And it is uh, good to hear that India is also thinking about that for uh, uh, laying hands. So let us please uh, talk a bit more about this in the breakout groups. Um, now we need to move on. Uh, there is so much ground to cover. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Susana Pombo, uh, who is the Chief Veterinary Officer of Portugal. Um, and as you know, Portugal holds at the moment the presidency of the Council of the EU. Uh, Dr. Pombo, or, or I, I heard I can say Susana, uh, the EU and India will meet uh, this Saturday. Um, and when we look at this EU-India strategic partnership, there is a clear basis to start cooperating together on animal welfare. And in this slide, it is also good to refer to the UN Food System Summit's objectives to strengthen uh, sustainable food systems and to rethink uh, our food systems. Um, Susanna, which aspects should be taken into account in your view and to what extent can animal welfare contribute to achieving uh, these goals? We will be curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you, thank you. First of all, good morning to you all. I want to start by thanking the invitation to be here today, and I sincerely hope that this event allows us to contribute for strengthening relations between the two countries in the field of increasing sustainability in livestock production. EU and India are two of the world's largest areas, and so we believe that there is a common interest in ensuring security, prosperity, and sustainable development in a multipolar world, and that is why we welcomed the increasing convergences between the EU and India. Climate change, biodiversity losses, and the environmental degradation are an existential threat to Europe and to the world to overcome these challenges, Europe needs a new growth strategy that allows transforming the Union into a modern, resource efficient and competitive economy. That is why Europe is committed to achieve the goals established under the European Green Deal. The Farm to Fork strategy is at the heart of the European Green Deal, aiming to make food systems fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly, and therefore to accelerate our transition to a sustainable food system. Good animal welfare is indeed an integral part of sustainable animal production and of sustainable food systems. The welfare of animals is an issue of great importance to European citizens, so it is, has been recognized as such by the Union law. Over the past years, the European Council and its preparatory bodies have been particularly active on animal welfare. As early as 2012, the European Commission announced in its communication on the European Union strategy for the protection and welfare of animals 2012-2015 that would consider a new EU framework to increase transparency and suitability of information to consumers on animal welfare for their purchase choice. In this respect, specific attention was assigned to the valorization of animal welfare standards to enhance the competitiveness of the EU food industry. Seven years later, in December 2019, the European Council adopted conclusions on animal welfare as an integral part of sustainable animal production. For this reason, the Council recognized that animal welfare legislation should be further developed and updated to consider current practical problems, more recent scientific knowledge and technical developments, and invited the Commission to assess the need for and impact of an EU regulatory framework with criteria for animal welfare labeling schemes, considering national experience. 
Currently, Portugal holds the presidency of the European Council and has taken animal welfare as one of the priority issues as an integral part of a more sustainable and efficient production system, so we are strongly committed to this issue. The present moment offers great challenges, but also opportunities. At European level, we have, we have the ambition to create more sustainable, more innovative, fairer food systems that guarantee the best conditions for all the food chain, not forgetting the motivations and convictions of consumers. It's perceptible that welfare of animals has clearly entered the public policy mainstream in a growing number of countries, which are implementing new procedures and policies to improve the welfare of animals in our care. The World Organization of Animal Health Codes plays an important role on this, being the base of the work that is done by 182 countries on animal welfare. As these standards are accepted at the at a global level, they have an important role on trade agreements. In fact, the World Organization for Animal Health is an international organization with 182 member countries, which have given it a mandate to improve animal health and welfare all over the world. For more than 19 years, this organization has worked to achieve the transparency of global animal health situation, including diseases transmissible to humans, update and publish disease prevention and control methods to ensure the sanitary safety of world trade in animals and their products, and to strengthen national animal health systems. These actions have been solidified through the adoption of international standards by delegates of OIE member countries, which are recognized as reference by the World Trade Organization. Therefore, I'm convinced that we will closely cooperate on food, nutrition and agriculture, including on sustainable food systems in view of the upcoming United Nations Food Systems Summit, an ambitious summit with objectives that are similar to ours. I believe that success will always depend on maintaining a permanent dialogue and the exchange of experience will lead us to adopt better practices and thus contribute to better animal welfare and consequently harmonization of relevant criteria in our trade relations. Coming back to you, many thanks. Many uh, thanks, Susanna, and indeed uh, a lot of uh, relevant developments come together here. The EU working on animal welfare legislation, uh, a lot of talk about the future of our food systems. Uh, so let us uh, continue uh, this uh, conversation also after today. Uh, finally, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Lucie Carouet. She's the deputy head of the Animal Welfare and Antimicrobial Resistance Unit in the European Commission's Directorate General for Health and Food Safety. Uh, Mrs. Carouet, uh, the cause of pandemics, we heard it already uh, a lot before, uh, is huge. Uh, and the role uh, played by intensive farming systems is, is often pointed out. How do you think the EU and India could work together on, on this in the future to ensure we build more of those sustainable and resilient livestock farming systems, uh, taking due account um, of animal welfare and the need to address uh, AMR, and this is really your your something you you have connected already in your unit. And how do you think that the EU and India could could benefit from working together on this? Mrs. Carouet, the floor is yours. M many thanks for your question, and many thanks for the invitation. Indeed, well, many speakers have uh, already referred to the very two important strategies that have been adopted at EU level: the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. These strategies give us very clear message and objective. We should work to improve the sustainability of our food systems, taking account of all dimensions of sustainability and in particular animal welfare and antimicrobial resistance, AMR. Uh, but the farm to fork strategy also is very clear about the fact that this can only be achieved by working to, together with other countries uh, at global level and in particular with our main partners. Um, so we need global actions on both fronts, so animal welfare and AMR. Uh, and it's actually a reason why um, we in the EU have proposed to include these so-called game-changing solutions uh, in these areas uh, on the U UN Food Systems Summit that will take place uh, in the second half of this year. Um, 
India is very a very important partner for the EU, um, as as we mentioned it already. Uh, indeed, there is not at the moment a formal agreement in place that foresees a structured cooperation between the EU and India uh, on animal welfare (OMR). But this does not prevent us from already now cooperating on an ad hoc basis uh, on these issues, because I know that the the positions uh, are not far apart and there are very important discussions taking place at the moment uh, as we speak in international standard setting bodies, uh, the OIE for animal welfare codex and the FAO uh, for AMR. So on these issues, uh, it is very welcome uh, if uh, we can work together and take ambitious positions during these international discussions, which uh, are really crucial to, to set the, the, the tone of the uh, um, global approach on animal welfare and AMR. Um, just a few words about where we are in the EU on these uh, two areas. Uh, this one was very clearly said in the, in the nice video we, we heard at the beginning. Um, on animal welfare, we are at an historical moment in the EU because we are revising the entire set of uh, EU legislation on animal welfare, uh, covering on-farm welfare, but also slaughter and transport. Um, we have already launched an evaluation of the existing uh, legislation, and we are about to launch the process of what we call in our jargon the impact assessment. So basically, it's the steps to prepare the legislative proposal that uh, is scheduled for end 2023. Uh, and uh, as uh, Susanna mentioned as well, we are exploring options for uh, an animal welfare label or labeling framework. Uh, so this is the reason why it is uh, especially now a good moment to, to reinforce uh, and step up the dialogue uh, with partners because we are at this, shape, at this stage where things are being shaped. Uh, on AMR, the EU has recently taken very important steps. Uh, in the farm to fork strategy, we have set a target for the reduction of the overall EU sales of antimicrobials for farmed animals by 50% by 2030. Uh, this is supported by a recent uh, legislation on, on veterinary medicinal products, which adopted a series of uh, ambitious measures to fight AMR such as a ban on preventive use of antimicrobials in groups of animals and an enlarged ban on the use of antimicrobials for growth promotion. I just want to insist on, on these aspects. Uh, it, was, it has been said by previous speakers, AMR is the next global health threat. It has been known for many years. It's a, a slower health threat than COVID, but it is still a very important health threat. Uh, we know that uh, our antibiotics are becoming inefficacious uh, and that there are very few new antibiotics are being developed. So we need to take action now. Uh, and for, for the EU, we are calling all partners, all countries in the world to take measures, including in the animal health area, such as the phasing out of uh, antibiotics for growth promotion. Um, just before closing, I want to repeat again that India is an important partner for the EU. and. Uh, Checking with my colleagues who are working on uh, international relations, I understand that projects are already on being launched uh, at the moment. For example, a regional project on AMR is being discussed um, and some, uh, some experiences are being exchanged between the EU Farm to Fork strategy and the Eat Right India strategy developed by the Indian government. Uh, just a, a last word, because I found the uh, experience shared by Dr. Yoshi, extremely interesting indeed on the, uh, the battery cages in poultry uh, in India. Uh, indeed, uh, we are also working at the moment on the response to uh, EU citizens initiative, which is asking for the phasing out of uh, cages in animal farming. Uh, so we are now preparing the commission response and it is indeed very, very very useful to, to share experiences in, in this domain at this very moment. Many thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Caroué, uh, for pointing out these very uh, relevant future avenues also for collaboration, uh, notably AMR uh, and uh, the use of cages. Um, now, we have taken up a lot of uh, time, uh, but um, uh, our uh, support uh, is saying that we can still uh, um, 
answer one question, discuss one more question. So I would like to ask you, uh, Farda, do we have any questions from the audience? Otherwise, I have a long list, so no worries. Um, uh, there's a question um, for Dr. Ashok. Um, so Dr. Ashok, the EU imposes uh, certain animal welfare standards on imports. Uh, these trade measures can have a positive impact as they uh, provide incentives for foreign producers to adopt higher standards or to stop unsustainable produ uh, production. How can such approach be better pursued, uh, Dr. Ashok? Thank you, Dr. Varda. Actually, uh, there is a regulatory body. Uh, uh, this uh, you, you might be aware about this food safety stand standards and the standards of authority of India. They look after all the quality things of the food products. And uh, uh, if uh, we go, uh, for example, if we go for milk, we start testing the milk in even our remote areas uh, where at the time of collection uh, we uh, do it for uh, fat and uh, snf etc then milk is pulled it comes to different cooperatives and again tests are being done and uh, not only that uh, indian council of agriculture research uh, we are continuously working uh, on this aspect uh, just to develop different EG tests uh, for adulteration of the milk, uh, to detect the adulteration of milk, which have been recognized and accepted by FSSI, uh, Food Safety and Standard Authority of India. And uh, these are being practiced uh, by our uh, this uh, milk producer. But naturally, if anything is being exported, it will be uh, by the organized sectors. So quality monitoring is being done in uh, uh, organized sectors and it is being done with backup uh, from the uh, our legislation another important thing uh, regarding this uh, i could get the opportunity uh, to just add few points uh, for example amr we are discussing department of animal husbandry and dairying has already given an advisory to the uh, livestock uh, sector not to use some of the emergency antimicrobials like cholestein in our country, uh, which has been, uh, this advisory has already been issued. This is uh, what we all colleagues are discussing here. This is really highly important that without seeing uh, uh, or without caring the animal welfare, it is not going to be possible to produce the safe uh, and healthy animals as well as uh, healthy food. And uh, that too uh, will be with compromised uh, production status. Uh, I, I can simply, if you take it as a balance, you take animals on this side, this you take environment, here you take uh, uh, environment, uh, here you are dealing with all ecosystem. Here you take the uh, infectious agent. Now you simply see if our infectious agent will be strong enough uh, because of this environment, as it happened in case of COVID-19, it will overcome the host, whether it is animal or human. If host is strong enough, it can have the ability to resist the infectious agent or the disease. So through animal welfare, we have to make our host stronger with a balanced environment or ecosystem. That way we have to go and that way our organizations, whether research institutes under Department of Agriculture Research and Education, including ICR, or our government constitutional things I have been described by my earlier colleagues from India like Ashutosh and Vijay. Uh, we are working towards that side and uh, I hope that that will uh, we will be able to meet the expectations of EU2 and uh, in exchange uh, we, we will also expect the same uh, from EU countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vada. It was a little bit lengthy, but just I wanted to add a few points. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ashok. Uh, and I would like to thank all our panelists for their contributions uh, today. It was really interesting, really valuable. I think we also 
uh, concluded that there's a lot of ground uh, to cover uh, together uh, in the future and that animal welfare is not a standalone issue, that it is closely connected to uh, multiple other issues and that it cannot be sidelined, uh, therefore, as was the case in the past, but it will not be anymore uh, in the future because of uh, our joint work. Um, so now you will be assigned to um, the breakout groups, and this is always a sort of miracle that happens. Uh, if you're not in the right group, uh, just address that uh, with your moderator. Uh, so we have three groups uh, on fish, uh, poultry and, and dairy. Um, and uh, the breakout sessions will last for about 30 minutes. We will reduce that time a bit and then you will all come back uh, to the plenary and we will wrap up the outcomes of these discussions, which will really zoom on in on how EU India can work uh, together on addressing uh, animal welfare within uh, these areas. Perspectives of fish welfare. Uh, do, will you be taking notes? Yes, certainly. Hi, I'm Doug, a uh, fish program leader at Eurogroup for Animals, and I will uh, try to contribute. And I'm especially taking notes on our uh, discussion in here. Yeah. Okay. So um, to start the discussion, uh, I'll just give a brief uh, background of um, what is the you know objective for. Uh, uh, this discussion. Uh, we want to discuss and identify the key welfare issues of aquaculture. And uh, we want that, you know, uh, during our discussion, we are able to come to some uh, recommendations to achieve welfare standards for uh, in aquaculture for shrimp and uh, tilapia or, you know, fish uh, uh, farming in uh, EU and India trade. So I uh, like to start, uh, I like to ask uh, you know, everybody that uh, what do you think about how we can improve the welfare of uh, shrimp and aquaculture products, fishes, and uh, what impact can it have in EU and India relations? Can we start with that? Anybody? Sure. Um... Specifically on um, problems associated with uh, fish in India, um, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Karthik. I'm the managing director of the India office um, of Fish Welfare Initiative. Um, what we've noticed during our field work, I think we've, we've uh, looked into about 100 plus farms at this stage, and uh, we're looking into more as we go along. Uh, we're also working with partners on the ground to introduce fish welfare um, in many farms where there's possibility of scaling up. Uh, what we've noticed as far as problems um, connected to welfare are is that current practices um, stock higher than, um, than the carrying capacity of the system. Uh, that's one major issue. Uh, the other major issue is connected to, um, you know, excessive usage of uh, chemicals in the system. For instance, uh, in, in a recent uh, harvest, uh, we witnessed that during the harvest time, um, the farmers have introduced about four or five chemicals into the system. They've put in alcohol to sedate the fish. They've put in antibiotics and anti, um, you know, antifungal agents to kind of sort of make sure that uh, that they travel safer um, and don't contract any diseases during this period. And uh, they also put in um, a lot of um, uh, other agents like oxygen, you know, um, oxygen powder and so on and so forth to increase the oxygen supply to the fish. Now. We don't know what it, what these individual impact uh, individual in these things individually impact uh, how they impact the fish just yet, but the chemical load of the system increases tremendously every time they harvest, and they harvest fairly often. The current practice is that um, there's a three to four month harvest cycle for every system, and every time um, there is um, there seems to be a mortality rate of ten percent. So you're killing a lot of fish every time you harvest and there's too many harvest cycles. Um, 
And one of the other problems that we, uh, we witnessed uh, is that with, um, with the way they're raising juveniles, um, there's very high mortality. In some cases, 80 to 90% of the fish uh, die, juvenile fish die and reach into uh, the fingerling stage, at which point they're transported to um, grow up ponds to grow. I think these are some of the major problems that we've witnessed. Uh, and this is, this is all true about um, both, uh, sorry, uh, this is all true about a particular species uh, within the carp family, right? Um, species within the carp family. I mean. um, other uh, species, uh, tilapia, I think is mostly what is consumed in the EU. Uh, more about that has to be understood. Uh, more research has to go into understanding what happens there. That's it from my end. Thank you. Thank you, Karthik. Uh, uh, and uh, so the next, uh, if anybody has any inputs on what Karthik has mentioned, please uh, feel free to add. Anyone? Yeah. Can I come in, Sarjana? Yes, yes, Dr. Vijay. Okay. Yeah. As have been pointed out, uh, actually the shrimps, uh, the aquaculture is very, very important from India trade point of view, as well as the annual welfare point of view, because we are exporting more than a billion dollars. This is the third largest export, and it's very, very important for government that we do exactly the right thing. And, and as far as animal welfare issues are concerned with the fish, uh, I'm a vet basically, but we have not been trained much in the fish uh, welfare, but I see a huge gap that we see that fish is not feeling pain or fish is like any other vegetable or something like that. That is the main perception. But it is not so. The fish have all this, this means they are even far intelligent species than the primates. So they have all the system. But uh, issue is that how much veterinary cares are being given to them, how, how many specialists are being trained that they can give the veterinary care to them. And uh, as, as have been pointed out, the antibiotic is a major issue because if antibiotic residue comes in, that the consignment get rejected and they come back. So farmers are now doing a lot of monitoring of antibiotic residue at farmer labor also. So that is the development, but there is a stock density is high. The biggest problem that I see is that there is so many authorities are involved, I tell you. For food, we have Food Safety Standard Authority of India that is our homegrown food. If it has to be exported, it is Export Inspection Council. If it is aquaculture, then it is Coastal Aquaculture Authority. More than that, the animal feed is not regulated itself. So if somebody is missing the feed, antibiotic to the animal feed, there is no control. Who is controlling that? So this I came to know when I was dealing with AMR in Food Safety Standard Authority of India, that it is not being regulated. And coming to another issue that we have advisory issued, but advisory have no legal binding. Advisory that you say, okay, you put a mask, I put a, don't put is my choice. So advisories, I have, don't have tooth basically. So uh, I see the multiplicity of the organizations who are controlling and complicated things not being understood by farmer, trainings are not being done to farmer. Now, but good thing is that Ministry of Commerce, I recently read a news article that initially farmer used to monitor the antibiotic when exporting this, but now they are started to, there is, a, there is a incentive and scheme from the Department and Ministry of Commerce that they have started to monitor the input which is going, like water, feed and everything, they start to test before the feed. So I just say that fish is at good head like any other living being, okay? Though no veterinary cares and you are killing them like anything, cutting their fins and um, all those freezing and transport is also not in a very good point, I means how they are being transported is also not very uh, appreciable or commendable. So I see there is a, uh, there is a scope for a lot of improvement and uh, possibly if we can do a kind of a study where we can find out all this evidence and tell to the some delegation will be a good idea. 
So that's uh, my thought, basically. Another thing, just I want to say that collagen sulfate is now being banned to be used. This is being banned by Cedisco. Cedisco, another is agency. Okay, this is another I forgot to mention. Central Drug Standard Control Organization. This is under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. They control antibiotic. Food is controlled by FSSI. Coastal Aquaculture Control Authority call the Coastal and Export Inspection Council con control the export. So basically, uh, this is being, cholesterol is being banned by FSSI as well as by uh, Cedisco. So see, it cannot be used as a growth promoter in the streams and all this uh, fish aquaculture and everything. Uh, this is the addition from my side. So it is important to say that we should train the farmer and let people know that fish is also a living being. Basic point also we need to make clear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay. Uh, also, in uh, we I, have sorry, seen, could I uh, come ask for a point of clarification as I type some notes? I didn't recognize yeah. the name of the growth promoter that uh, has been banned. Um, cholestein sulfate and cholestein sulfate. Thank you. This is high priority critical antibiotic uh, classified by WHO and it is banned by all regulators for uses in veterinary, aquaculture, and for growth promotion by Cedisco and FSSI. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Uh, also, May I come in? Uh, uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Smita Sirohi. I'm advisor agriculture and marine products based in Embassy of India. So we are looking after India EU trade in aquaculture and all other animal products. But as you know, for rest of the animal products, our residue monitoring plans are not in place. So it is only the aquaculture and fishery products which we are exporting. And the question which uh, the point which has been made by some of the earlier uh, delegates i would just like to say something that as far as the output which is there for trade particularly to eu countries there is a whole lot of traceability there and uh, empida has put in place a very uh, systematic uh, system you know it's uh, it's not like that their uh, farmers are using antibiotics and all I and mean, that can be reflected in whole lot of improvement which india has done in uh, supplying safe food to eu uh, the animal welfare issue, nobody is denying that animal welfare issues are, are important. But at the same time, these animal welfare issues should not become another non-tariff barrier for uh, India-EU trade or trade with any third country for that matter. Uh, in any case, we already know that uh, several food safety standards in EU are much higher than the codex standards. They are based on the hazard-based approach rather than the risk-based approach. Uh, so there is a lot which the countries say, uh, the third countries say that, you know, they are actually potentially uh, restricting trade. So I appreciate the welfare issues, but at the same time, I would emphasize that we should not have any, any such regulations coming in place or any such measures which are coming in place from the side of EU, which will be trade restricting. Um, thank you, uh, Smita, ma'am. I think, yes, uh, we agree that, you know, uh, animal welfare is important as well as trade, and it is very important for the country. Uh, but, you know, as we have discussed that animal welfare is an important aspect also of production, sustainability, and trade. And, uh, you know, definitely here we are talking about uh, the exports to EU and trade, and uh, you have correctly, you know, mentioned that they have higher standards, and we are already, you know, all the things that we produce, especially for EU, uh, the uh, farms, the factories, the processing units, all have uh, proper standards. But in general, if we see, you know, other than trade, uh, the welfare standards uh, for the products or for the animals that are consumed within India, they are really low. And I think, you know, during these discussions, it is important uh, where we uh, uh, completely agree that, you know, uh, uh, it should not be difficult for countries to trade. And it is important for, you know, livelihoods of people. But we also want to discuss that how the welfare can be improved uh, at, you know, no cost to trade. In fact, uh, you know, it should promote uh, trade. It should, you know, welfare should be uh, done in such a way that we are able to uh, give, you know, better uh, exports to EU. Uh, definitely, ma'am. Thank you so much. 
and uh, uh, we have seen that in uh, you know some of the studies in india that uh, crustaceans and fish you know the water quality aspect uh, in both uh, in raising both these species if it is shrimp farms or uh, you know fishes in aquaculture there are certain things uh, that are you know not uh, appropriate that are not animal welfare friendly uh for example the oxygen level the ph uh, value of water and stocking density uh and we don't have any criteria uh, in india at least for uh, uh these aspects uh what how can uh, it is my question to everyone what do you think how we, how can we improve this how can we work on this factor and uh which you know which it definitely you know it, it interlinks with the welfare it has impact on disease it has impact on use of antimicrobials so how can we um, you know improve these factors in the interest of animal welfare reducing animal stress and reducing the use of antimicrobials One of the benefits of the system in India is that most of it is extensive. Um, in fact, one of the best ways to keep costs down is to reduce, um, you know, find ways to reduce inputs as opposed to adding more inputs to the system, right? Um, when we keep the stocking density slow, when we keep the water quality um, to a level where fish are, uh, fish welfare is prioritized, the advantage is that we need to use less antibiotics, less, um, you know, less inputs, and the cost of both these things reduces. What is also uh, important to understand is that most of the farmers who farm fish, uh, you know, lease the ponds, lease the area. So the lease time also decreases because when you, when you actually uh, reduce the number of fish, um, they grow faster and, you know, you can get your output more quickly. You can run more cycles essentially. So the idea that uh, the only way to achieve productivity is to increase the number of fish being reared uh, needs to disappear. Uh, and uh, what needs to be understood is that extensive production and reducing uh, stocking densities can have a positive impact on the incomes of the farmers. And at the same time, you're producing, more people are producing higher quality fish which would lead to uh, increase in their capability to meet the standards required for trade as well. Um, I think training centered around these things are very valuable. Uh, also, a, you know, people investing time into privileging these systems and making those market linkages uh, would also be very useful as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, any other inputs from anybody how we can improve these uh, aspect of um, you know oxygen of water quality of uh, ph value and uh, stocking densities any other ideas on that from anyone yeah uh, sajana can you come in quickly yeah, yes yes dr vijay uh, actually ma'am it's now there are multiple and score of study which have been done that if the DG, indication of disease and happening of more of the disease and pathology itself indication of poor welfare. So if, if your well, the fish and the shrimps are getting more of the disease, it means that said, the condition where their leaves are not good. So now, as you say, how do we improve them? Now, I think the idea that we should to improve the environmental and hygienic condition like water, temperature, salinity, chemical, organic matter, oxygen level, and these all practices need to be improved upon and this is also the question from heaven king that how can the collaboration with the eu and india help us so it is a good idea now to collaborate and do some research which is domestically based in india that how much density is appropriate density which type of water is appropriate water which kind of oxygen level is appropriate level for which species so we cannot have the rule for across so these are the things which are well studied, but I don't think because I'm a vet and I'm in a different field, whether these have been studied well into Indian condition, but I think a good idea is to do the research in Indian context 
in the field condition where such farmer are existing and there is already input from the government side to start uh, to st uh, start such kind of uh, activity thank you thank you thank you so much uh, dr vijay for giving those inputs um anybody from eu uh, who can throw some light on what are the welfare standards for farm raised uh, shrimps in uh, eu or in any of the eu countries i could give a comment um for for fish there are there is more to say for shrimp there is there is not a uh, anything specific beyond the recognition of them as uh, sentient animals in the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. And that is at EU level. If we look inside individual countries, we'll find some examples where uh, the slaughtering and killing of crustaceans has welfare regulations around it. Um, but not on the, the farming conditions, not in a regulatory sense. So uh, even for uh, fishes? For fish, uh, yes, there are specific requirements uh, on the tra live transport of fish. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're they're uh, included in, in all the different uh, sections of the main regulation governing the transport of animals. So there are all kinds of requirements around um, record keeping, and preparations of the journey and reporting and providing conditions for fish during transport. Yep. Um, on slaughter and farming conditions for fish, there are general requirements to consider the welfare and reduce pain, distress and suffering. And um, coming away from the hard uh, regulations, then there's a range of recommendations and best practices from EU and national authorities um, with a lot of detailed recommendations and standards for different aquaculture systems uh, and different species. Okay, and Doug, what about implementation of these recommendations and standards in um, EU or you know, in specific countries? So as you said that you know, there are standards for tranquilizing and transportation. But what about raising? What about you know when they are raised? Uh, what about oxygen level, pH, and all that? How are uh, EU countries uh, you know regulating that or testing that or uh, you know making sure that there are some welfare uh, measures being followed when they are raised? Is there anything on that that you can assess that the, you know they are mandatory? Yes, it's a very mixed picture. Um... So at uh, at one level, uh, I could I, I could identify Norway um, with a very large aquaculture sector and uh, quite detailed fish welfare specific legislation, which is the, their approach to fish health management and food safety and public safety. It is all comes under their fish welfare umbrella, and under that uh, there are huge volumes of very detailed prescriptions and quantities and parameters for different species in, in different systems produced by their authorities. Um, and, and some countries in Europe have uh, nothing specific. And, and I can also find examples of ev everything in between. OK, so um... If I conclude, that means there are no mandatory standards as such for other EU countries while raising uh, fishes at the farms. There are uh, general requirements around using general wording to make sure that the uh, water is appropriate and the housing conditions are appropriate. And then and, and a minority of European countries have a guideline document that makes it specific. Um, some have a number for oxygen, but not many. And what about, uh, you know, uh, implementation? What about, you know, who goes and check? Are there any authorities that go to these farms and make sure that, you know, guidelines or 
uh, uh, the uh, whatever is being recommended is followed is there any such mechanism uh, yes there is they all have enforcement mechanisms um fish is not usually high on their priority <laughs> list but there i have there are certainly examples of um uh, implementation authorities uh, taking enforcement procedures or at least early steps and and using that framework to uh, tell farmers to change their practices certainly yeah Okay, thank you. Thank you, Do, for that. And um, anybody who wants to input, anybody who wants to give uh, inputs on this, what Doog has said, anybody from EU? I'd be interested to put uh, eye stock ablation on the agenda for shrimp and especially because this practice that's common in hatcheries, it, uh, it will increase the number of eggs uh, you're producing in your hatchery. But uh, there's been two research projects recently that have, have shown that if they don't use this uh, painful procedure, they get less eggs, but the shrimp are much more resilient to specific the, the major diseases threat that are a threat to fish farming and um some sort cert, international certifiers are already including it in their standards i wonder if there's a view in, in indian shrimp farming adopting this technology um and one of the the, the new solutions is under a, a, the ip is with a big shrimp farming company in thailand cp and there's another a, research project that has the results more uh, open and available and uh, with one minute left I'd be interested if there's barriers to uptake or a strategy for uptake in India. Okay I'm sorry I think you know the room I got the message that room is about to close in a minute uh, so, so I think we can discuss this uh, maybe do one mail it's uh, really interesting and uh, we have to see that um, uh, sorry heaven has a question does anyone know Okay, yeah, so heaven, I think we need some more data on that. Um, so we just have like two minutes remaining. So anybody who wants to give any inputs or ideas on improving the welfare condition of either shrimp or um, uh, fishes, so that we can uh, put that in notes, any ideas around the issues, any idea around improving the welfare, or implementation of standards. So, Zena, maybe through the mail, if you can uh, uh, put across the kind means um, this uh, possibility to do welfare research in India on uh, fish and crustacean will be a good idea because uh, I don't know many of people, you know, all of them. So, those who are interested and you can collaborate and do, like recently there was a question from him on how much and this level of the eye ablation is happening, level of antibiotic usage. If there is a possibility, so of collaboration will be a good idea to connect with the right people. Absolutely. I think uh, those of us who've wanted to do some research on this could collaborate and uh, work together. That would be fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, that is a good. Recommendation, sure, sure. I think, Dr. Vijay, that we should look at, you know, future collaborations for welfare and also future research, maybe with institutes or, you know, collective research among organizations. I think that is a very good idea that we should pursue it. And I will yeah. definitely, Dr. Vijay, send that email across. As of now, whatever we are tracking is based on experience. And if you have a hardcore data, it will be a good idea, basically. Yes, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do we can uh, you can put that at one as one of the recommendations regarding research which is required. Hello, welcome to everyone. So my name is Francesca and I work on uh, uh, farm animal welfare at your group for animals and I will moderate this session together with uh, uh, Dr. Dinesh. Um, so uh, the aim of this group is to uh, discuss 
uh, the main uh, animal welfare issue in broiling and uh, laying hands. As you may know, uh, even if the organic sector in the European Union is gaining more, you know, uh, uh, more and more market share, in reality, the majority of, uh, of broiler and laying hands are still farmed under uh, intensive uh, condition. Um, we, we hope that the farm to fork uh, uh, will bring us uh, uh, drastic changes uh, uh, in the way these animals are farmed, especially because we would like to avoid the uh, mistakes that were done at the time of the laying and directive, for instance, when the directive banned the use of, uh, uh, of uh, cages, but uh, legitimated the use of enriched cages, uh, which means that farmers had to invest to make a change and in the end, you know, the gain in terms of animal welfare was not so uh, so relevant, was quite poor. So um, we are pleased today to be together to uh, to discuss uh, uh, which are the main uh, animal welfare issue uh, in this production in India and the EU, and also to try to uh, um, outline certain recommendations that we can use to bring forward the discussion in terms of international uh, EU trade. Uh, so I leave the floor to uh, Dinesh uh, now, so he can uh, introduce uh, uh, himself and to uh, guide you through the discussion. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dinesh, and I am a co-moderator with Francesca. And uh, uh, we have set up a few questions and we would like to have a discussion on those and come up with the recommendations where we can go back to the forum and share those. Francisca. Do you want me to ask the question? Yes. Yeah. So the first question that we have, uh, uh, that we have defined is about the key issue uh, both in laying hands and uh, broiler production in India. And we would like to um, better uh, understand uh, how is the, the situation in India in terms of uh, uh, what has been done and why do you think that if you know problems still persist, nothing so effective has been done today uh, until today. So which, are, which were the main challenges uh, and that uh, the, the movement in India had to face uh, and uh, prevented them from really um, achieving uh, uh, concrete results in terms of, uh, of welfare? Maybe one of the participants that is joining uh, from India can uh, can uh, can join. Hello. Welcome. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Ashdeep, and I work for Mercy for Animals in India. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things, and this this is applicable to both uh, layer hand production, uh, production and broiler production. I'll say even, even the cage-free systems or even the higher welfare systems that we do have in India for um, layer hands. Um, recently, I was speaking to somebody, um, you might know Jessima, who you know, was responsible for getting these cage-free systems and facilities instituted. He said, even the systems, even the facilities we do have, there's a lack of experience on, on behalf of producers on how to manage these systems. They're not able to find people um, to come um, oversee these KHP facilities as well. Because I'm sure you know, even, even within KHP facilities, there's an issue of you know, increased mortality um, where uh, between, between hands. So the, if from the producer's angle, no matter how much we want to have higher welfare systems in place, we currently don't have the experience or expertise from a producer perspective to help make these transitions. And even for facilities which have already transitioned, um, there is a struggle on how to manage these facilities. So I think focusing on the producer's perspective is, is something we need to be doing uh, more often. And um, was there any kind of uh, uh, program uh, uh, or guidelines that were uh, activated to somehow uh, filling this uh, this gap in India so far, or still is something that 
is left to uh, let's say to to producer beliefs or uh, management skills or there was a kind of program if it's not governmental one or in terms of ngos or so on why no one thought about doing this kind of uh, uh, process started this kind of process process yes yeah, so, so there is definitely um a crunch in terms of uh, capacity in term even even when ngos do handhold you know certain producers in getting them to transition um there is a lack of expertise there is a lack of um individuals or special animal welfare specialists um at ngos because ngos don't have the funding to get these on board so even if ngos do help a particular um for, uh, you know farmer transition towards the cage free facility um it becomes harder for them to uh, find talent because there is so much resource constraint in terms of financials and uh, talent uh, to see this through towards the end so i think it is something that ngos are beginning to focus on more um in southeast asia as well so even if you look at global food partners whose entire um uh, whose entire mo is to just help uh, producers transition or companies meet their uh higher welfare needs i think having people focused specifically on producers is something we we could be doing is there someone the else that want to uh, add on this contribution I, i'm sorry i am really bad with pronunciation but i think is uh, arsh deep the name correct that's correct get so someone else want to intervene on this point I think that this is something that also on the European perspective we we had and indeed in the in the past year we, we saw that the European Parliament is uh, approving the so-called pilot projects uh, that are really meant to, to you know to help produce and in transitioning so <clears throat> it's now really um, what I see at least maybe is my perception is that these pilot projects are more and more um uh, focusing on a you know practical uh, and concrete approach uh, to really help producer to make the changes because the legislation per se unfortunately without this kind of uh, uh, of help and support is not really uh, really really helpful um so if someone else uh, want to add also on the european perspective uh, or if had you know ideas on this uh, yeah please joe yeah hello uh, joe sweep from humane society international um we we've been looking uh, in the past at the issue of uh, um the welfare particularly of laying hens in india and uh in dinner she mentioned uh, jai simha uh, our former colleague um one of the issues that was raised with us uh, by our indian colleagues um was the fact that um uh, cages cage systems that are banned in the eu are actively being marketed by uh eu companies in india um so effectively you know the what we've got rid of we're kind of still dumping on other countries and there was also mentioned at the time that there were um these systems were also being used uh by small poultry farmers not necessarily just the the the, the big operations but that uh, farmers have been advised to kind of essentially stick their their uh, their hens even though they may only have you know 50 in in tiny cages um the other issue that uh was raised at the time and it's going back uh, several years ago was that um the use of uh battery cages was in conflict with the um rulings of the Indian Animal Welfare Council if i recall correctly i'm just wondering from our indian colleagues um you know what kind of discussion there's been on that so far in the, in the, in the future i'm i'm going back several years ago that uh, that we were looking on this and we actually started talking to some of the um big um animal housing system producers to try to discourage them from uh, from marketing these cages someone wants to intervene on this do you have information i'm not uh so on the first point on the marketing of of those battery cage system uh systems in india i'm not aware of that but on the latter there currently exists a moratorium um an interim moratorium issued by the delhi high court on any new facilities um being instituted um 
uh, any new battery case facilities being instituted. So like I think was said in the main panel, um, there are new rules that have been set up, which are currently with the state governments. Um, so they haven't been finalized, they're all drafts. And there's an ongoing matter in the Delhi High Court on this particular issue um, right now. I hope that answers at least the second question. So if someone else uh, wants to add something, otherwise I, I go to the second question because I see that time is, uh, is, uh, is running. Um, so the second question is about the uh, expected move uh, um, uh, toward the cage free uh, um, in egg production. So uh, as you have, uh, have heard by the commission representative in the European Union, there was a, a European citizens initiative. Um, which succeeded, it means that now the, the Commission has to reply and um, what we think is that uh, there could be a ban uh, of the use of the so-called enriched cages in the European Union and uh, now we would like to discuss with you, um, as there is discussion also about the possibility of importing, of uh, sorry, of uh, applying this ban in the use of, uh, of cages also to imported product. If you think that producers in, in, in India would be able to, uh, to, to, to meet and to improve standards in this sense, um, if you already think that the, the portion in the market that uh, uh, is producing uh, eggs uh, um, in the cage free system is already, you know, like, uh, um, uh, big enough to meet the standards successfully, or if you think that this ban in the European Union, if applied also to imported product, would have um, a huge impact on India, and uh, if you think that India could uh, could could support this uh, this impact. Any idea on that? In the European Union, we know that producers are complaining a lot uh, about this uh, uh, this ban of an uh, of enriched cages because they said that they already changed system once from battery cages to enriched cages, and so that now um, they uh, uh, they do not see scope for investing again in another in another uh, in another system. And also, they claim that um, uh, the mortality issue um, it's higher. Uh, so the mortality rate is higher uh, in uh, out of cages than in cages where you can you know let's say control and manage and to get access to uh, to the single animal in an easier way uh, so is it the same uh, in india or um, is there another you know kind of challenges that maybe we cannot foresee in this moment from the uh, european perspective Arship, Arshdeep, now that I learned how to pronounce your name, I'm calling you again. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> li like I said, initially, uh, they have, there are very few facilities currently which exist. I'm sorry about my video being off. My internet is a bit uh, slow today. Um, so there are very few facilities that are completely cage free. Um, in India, and even those producers are struggling, and, and mortality is one of the issues that they struggle with, to find uh, skilled people to manage these facilities. So I think that's, that's an issue we're constantly facing. So I don't, um, that's, that's the only input I have on that. I don't know if there are, exp there are experts in the European Union who can you know, help um, in making this transition. Sorry if that didn't answer your question. Dinesh, do you have information on this? Do you think that uh, India would be ready to meet this, uh, uh, this European standard of cage-free uh, eggs, or would this have, uh, you know, an economic impact uh, um, that India could not, you know, face? Oh, as uh, Harshadeep said that this is the case pending, uh, case lies with the uh, court. And this is a new system which uh, India trying to adopt. And as he uh, mentioned, and I agree with him, that how this transition will take place at the farmer's level, that is most important. Because in India, uh, the product
production, uh, uh, the economic the importance of welfare at the farmer's perspective, not the farmer's perspective or for the industrialist or the producer perspective. They give more importance to the production rather than the welfare. And I think this is a very new uh, um, concept and uh, definitely it will take some time for this transition and uh, that for that reason we are discussing here the cooperation from EU, how we um, uh, go ahead with this change. So what the EU could do, uh, now I open the floor also to the uh, European participants, uh, in, your, in your mind, what the European Union could do uh, if they decide to go ahead with the ban and to impose the ban to imported product, what they could do or assist the transition in India? Is there any specific action that you foresee? Dialogue, uh, uh, training, capacity building, mission of, uh, of uh, veterinary experts. Uh, what do you think that would be the key to get this transition done? Is the collaboration with, yeah, go Linda, please. I really just wanted to lift up what was said in the first point, that it's the lack of experience. So uh, there are lots of organizations that are training the trainers. It feels like there seems to be a system that's needed with some people going out to have a course to train uh, and help support producers who then go out and uh, spread their knowledge to others. And this is going to have to happen within the European Union with producers themselves helping producers. And it seems like the same system could be used in Europe as in India, even if the situations are different. The principle of uh, this um, spreading out the knowledge by having a few people training a few and then those going out and training would be something that could be of benefit in, in both regions. And I just want to add on to that as a country that um, I come from Sweden and as a country that doesn't allow beak trimming and, move, and banned cages and moved over to these free systems, it's very clear that there is a learning process and it's important to get producers talking with other producers and, and sharing experiences. So I think facilitating something along that line or setting up a structure to facilitate it would link together the, the first response with this second one in, in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Any other um, uh, idea, suggestion? So basically what I got so far from the uh, discussion around these two questions is that the main gap in this moment is really to making producers in India aware that welfare counts. Um, and, uh, you know, like try to transpose the animal welfare as a value uh, to them. And for this, um, as Linda suggested, maybe the best would be to uh, create a training for people talking the same language, like producer to producer, maybe something that could uh, uh, could help. Joe, please go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, I don't know if anybody's on, uh, on this call from the European Commission, um, but they do have a program of uh, better training for safe food, uh, which also encompasses animal welfare. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps it's, it's, it's worth, you know, certainly with the larger producer, producers um, to also uh, see if, uh, if uh, some trainings can be set up on, uh, on uh, you know, management of particular systems uh, with, uh, with the Commission. Now, certainly if the Commission is also moving to the direction of uh, hopefully <laughs> going cage free and phasing out in rich cages, uh, within Europe, um, you know, we we need to be encouraging um, the uh, the use of those uh, those systems elsewhere, um, and I think it's also important um, also for, for for retailers, you know, as the uh, and uh, other manufacturers and, and of, of food products and you know hotel and restaurant chains, um, also to be able to switch to, for example, cage uh, they you know to increase the demand. For cage-free eggs, um, that I think is, is is something that you know could also be worked on. And I guess 
part of that would be the roles of the NGOs, such as ourselves, also to initiate dialogues with, uh, with the big producers, um, you know, to help them move in that direction and to understand how the systems can best work. And certainly, um, you know, given that the environmental conditions are different in India than they are in uh, the majority of, uh, of EU member states, um, purely difference in temperatures, um, that's also going to be relevant to how those systems can be best adapted to those environmental conditions as well. Absolutely. Any other contribution? David, you're too silent today. Oh, hi. So, yeah, I just please. want to say that, uh, yeah, I support um, uh, Joanna, Joanna's um, point of view. Uh, I don't work in India, but um, nor Europe, but uh, I work in China. And when I talk to producers to adopt cage-free systems, I think the, the question is not about lack of well, some of them do, but a lack of awareness of animal welfare. A lot of times the concern is about the market. It's about the consumer demand. So I got producers to tell me that we'd love to transi transition to cage free if you can find me buyers. So that's not a problem. And they, are, they, are, they welcome, they're open-minded about like uh, getting the te te technology uh, getting the uh, like a consultant consulting support from the firms. So yeah, I do think the marketing, uh, the market for cage free eggs is actually quite key. But I don't know if it's only China or it's it's the same in India. And how would you uh, address this? So how would you uh, try to increase uh, the consumer's demand? So what the, the an NGO can do or what an NGO can ask the government to do to, to increase this consumer demand for, uh, for higher welfare animal product, in this case, cage-free eggs? I don't have the answers to that. I just wonder like um, animal welfare groups in Europe, can they, um, do some work to uh, talk to the big corporates who are committed to source cage-free eggs. Uh, maybe that uh, encouragement can, uh, can be transferred from the European market to Asia market. That's my guess. Yeah. Any other idea on this point? Um, I just wanted to... Uh... Sorry. So, so Fran Francesca, I, I think uh, you've invited me to talk, so uh, so I've taken up the opportunity. I, th I think I think the most important thing, I mean, if uh, that that we should be doing is looking at uh, what are the differences in equivalence and standards between the two countries for laying hens and um, broiler chickens, what is India or the EU thinking of doing as part of this trade deal? I assume India is trying to open up exports in, in liquid and dried egg because that's, that's one of the, the easiest uh, tariffs to try and reduce and to increase trade um, and look at which products are the most sensitive. Where, where, are, where are the big differences in standards? Obviously with laying hens, there are huge differences. I'm not clear that there are big differences in broiler chicken standards. Um, and then once you've looked at what are the, the issues in terms of the difference in standards, where, where are the easy, um, easy wins that we need to try and ensure that um, you only get trade in equivalents um, on the standards? So that, I think, would be a very useful exercise for, for this group or, or for somebody to do. Yeah. Dinesh, do you want to come in? Thank you, David. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to one point uh, that we need to uh, sensitize the researchers in your cities and research institutes as well, because there may be many research or studies uh, going on where people uh, do uh, studies where which space allowance, uh, space allowance for the laying hens are better. So still the traditional research is being conducted in India. Uh, so we need to uh, target those 
the scientific community as well because those are the people who uh, give their recommendations or the into the policy maker to the policy makers and that comes to the industry or at the policy so that is most important so because i heard it's not the not it published but i heard uh, many professors they are doing research and they found 550 square feet uh, per square uh, centimeter square space is enough uh, for the laying hens but now we are talking about the free cage system but the researchers and the students and the community or the farmers they are happy with the 550s uh, this much of space which is recommended in the draft laying hens rules as well so in that case that is a very challenging how to convince them so i think what jo jona also said we need to find out how to train the trainers so that is i just i wanted to add thank you yeah absolutely so we have three minutes left um, and we have three questions. So I will pick up one um, that I think is, uh, uh, is relevant as it also came out during the plenary session of this, uh, of this event, which is about the antimicrobial resistance uh, issue. So as we know, this is a, a global problem. And uh, um, even if the European Union has a strategy to reuse the consumption of antimicrobials, in the end, we need to, you know, to find a way of uh, harmonizing uh, or connecting the, the world strategy that to make sure that uh, antimicrobial resistance will, uh, will be kept uh, under control, let's say. So uh, in terms of uh, EU-India cooperation, what do you think it could be done uh, in terms of uh, antimicrobial resistance? Uh, do you think that, uh, um, of course, if there is a trade agreement, we can think about adding some, you know, wording inside the trade agreement uh, uh, on antimicrobial resistance, but do you think something that more specifically can be done. Um, I don't know how is it in India, uh, the situation, how India is monitoring, if it's monitoring antimicrobial uh, usage. In the European Union, yes, um, they have a strategy in place, but just to be clear, they monitor the, the, the consumption of what is considered to be a, a veterinary relevant antimicrobials, and in the end, we have a lot of uh, other medicine that are used. Um, so um, is there something that do you think we can do uh, in, uh, in India uh, in this sense? Um... So Francesco, I'm, I'm looking at the clock and you have 102 seconds left. So my, my advice is to look at uh, the language in other FTAs the EU has. EU Mexico has very good language on antimicrobials and I would, I would suggest that as a start. Thank you also for reminding me that I'm late, as usual, as being Italian. <laughs> any other, <laughs> any other uh, contribution on that? No? Francisca? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, can I ask, uh, David, I don't understand the last point, what he said. Can you, can you please repeat it? Because he has the British accent uh, and it's difficult to, to follow. So speak slowly, David. Okay, okay. I will speak with an Italian accent uh, in 50 seconds. Uh, so the, um, there is good language in the EU-Mexico free trade agreement on antimicrobials. And I would suggest we look at that as a good starting place for where EU and, and India could, could end up on. Thank you, David. Okay, so I thank you, uh, all of you, for, for having participated to this session and for your contribution. Now I think that we can leave the room so we can rejoin the, uh, the main room. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, um, we were just discussing that, uh, I mean, I was in the fish room and uh, there was certainly a, 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 quite a debate going on there. And I think some of that is going to be carried over email. Um, perhaps others, uh, you know, other breakout sessions, uh, you know, sort of time is really never enough. Um, so uh, let's let's start with poetry. We'd love to hear what was discussed in different breakout rooms. Dr. Dinesh, you have the floor. Thank you, Varda. And uh, we have a very good discussion in the poetry session. 
and uh, i am giving the summary of those discussion although the animal welfare standards come uh, from uh, eu that the free case system uh, the participants believe that the free case system also reported mortality but and how that can be improved so the idea was to this can be improved with the help of eu cooperation and it was also discussed how the farmer transition can be made to adopt free case system that was also a challenge that is also a challenge how this transition can be made at the farmer and the producer level so the suggestions suggestion came that the ngos can help into this uh, in this transition it was also discussed that any new facilities being instituted instituted or there are some new rules can be made we also discuss about the free case system and one part i mean we all uh, it was a suggest uh, there is one suggestion that we can train the trainers because it is not about the uh, lack of resources or lack of technology but this is maybe because of the uh, lack of awareness and maybe uh, because of the no demand for the uh, uh, egg uh, cage free eggs or the products so there is uh, uh, there is need to look into the market demand and supply uh, so we can facilitate those things and uh, we also discussed that there is no much differences in the uh, laying hen standards in india and eu but there are much differences in the poultry chicken uh, broiler chicken between these two countries and lastly we discuss about the amr and uh, one participant suggested that there is a good language in uh, eu and mexico trade uh, where india can look into that how that amr can be reduced so these are the uh, short uh, salient points which uh, we discuss in the poultry session and if there is a still time uh, another i mean the participant from poultry they can also add on thank you thank you so much dr dinesh uh, lots of really interesting points there um moving on doug uh, what about fish welfare could you share um what was discussed in that breakout room yeah certainly so i uh, mostly uh, i can tell you some of the issues the welfare issues we identified and discussed and some steps that the group came up with that should we should we should see happen um, so it was identified first that seafood is a large and very important sector uh, for India, for export products and also for domestic food security. Uh, we uh, saw that um, in current aquaculture practices, uh, stocking densities are commonly higher than the carrying capacity of the water body of the system that the fish are in. Uh, and with that, there is um, often uh, excessive use of chemicals. Um, to sedate fish um, using antibiotics, antifungals, a, a wide range of chemicals are, are commonly put into these systems. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of mortalities, high mortality rates, especially at juvenile stages, up to 90% with some species. We came back to the antibiotic uh, question a few times. Um, use is certainly high, uh, prophylactic in the sector. Um, there have been efforts to control at the farm level and um, at least one has been banned, uh, but there is overall uh, a lack of a regulatory framework to even approach uh, handling the current antibiotic use. Um, and the, the approach has shifted from uh, controlling antibiotics at harvest and export point towards controlling the inputs uh, at the feeds and, and, and helping farmers know what they're really putting in their pond. Um, water quality, monitoring parameters, maintaining oxygen, uh, etc. often an issue. Uh, a universal problem that many authorities are relevant. It's very different, difficult to come up with and coordinate advice. Food safety authority, export controls, marine, marine licensing, freshwater licensing, drug controls. It's a complicated picture. Um, a social gap that people don't recognise that fish feel pain. Um, they're thought of sometimes like a vegetable. Uh, and uh, remembering with all of these issues that India has done a lot and achieved a lot and, and has and implements uh, a rigorous 
traceability system with its seafood products um, and its exporting uh, safe products at international standards and that um, there are concerns that animal welfare shouldn't become a, a non-tariff barrier to trade. And quickly, some of the steps we would like to see. Um, there's a lack of specialists and veterinarians available to support producers. Uh, there's a lack of training for farmers. These could be addressed by the uh, authorities. It would be useful to have a study mapping out uh, all of these issues, identifying what they are and how prominent they are. Um, it would be good to have a fo focus on extensive systems that use less inputs. Um, there are far less welfare and food safety problems emerging in these uh, extensive systems. Um, uh, there should be local uh, context um, technical research on, on fish's needs in aquaculture systems. There should be collaboration. Um, and there was a discussion in the chat which we didn't come to any conclusions on, which is how can uh, any improvements and, and technical measures coming through a trade discussion, how can that reach beyond exported animals uh, to those produced in India for domestic uh, use as well? Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, and can we finish with dairy animals, Ines? Yes, so thank you. So on the dairy uh, group, we kind of had a, a discussion about uh, how the sectors are at the moment in the EU and India, and what are the main uh, uh, welfare challenges. Intensification came up of the dairy industry as some of the main challenges for both uh, regions. Uh, in India specifically, and I think EU reflects the same, it led to a chasing of the lowest price, which uh, lead, led to an increase in uh, kind of the suffering of animals, so in disease and in food safety challenges as well. Um, and this is a very important uh, point because this will not allow, this is a massive barrier to allow for improvement on uh, animal welfare. Um, and there was also a discussion about going back to, to the traditional social culture of respecting animals in India and how that also is very important for an animal welfare improvement. And it could be an advantage that shouldn't be lost and could also be trade, uh, traded in the, in the, with the EU. Um, for, uh, there was also a clear uh, uh, indication that farmers will need support uh, in India to improve animal welfare. So the barrier to improving animal welfare, it's not a social economic one. So, and I will go into the, the points for uh, solutions next and then we will reflect on that. Also, we discussed about you having legislation, not specific for dairy though. So we, the, we'll see how the uh, revision of the animal welfare legislation in the EU can also provide a specific uh, legislation for dairy that can be traded as well or used on trade agreements. Um, but also there are some international standards that can be uh, used and as guidelines such as, as, guidelines, such as the OIE ones. But we also discussed that sometimes even those have gaps, for example, in the transport, as we've seen on the latest uh, um, months and years. Then it, we, we tried to highlight if we had one priority for animal welfare uh, improvement in the EU trade, uh, India trade agreement, well, what should it be? So there was good management practices and exchange of knowledge on those. So uh, we know we solve problems such as AMRs, we were discussing in other groups and so on. Uh, and painful procedures, for example, but also that there is a need to organize data and to scan uh, the data from uh, farmers in India. So the ones that are actually needing for help, such as, for example, small, small farmers, are not forgotten and are actually uh, helped with the, with the trade agreements. Um, then also we talked about the availability of alternatives to the dairy industry and how that can also help to then reduce the number of animals in the sector and actually uh, improve their welfare by doing so. Um, we finally discussed uh, about the, the possibility of these improvements um, to be integrated through specific guidelines and through sh uh, knowledge share. That was basically it. I don't know if Tanu, sorry, just to interrupt. I don't know if Tanu, you want to uh, add anything else. Yeah, I think you have covered all the points. And as I just would like to conclude uh, with a phrase, uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. So today, if we plant the seed of animal welfare in EU India trade relations, then definitely, very significantly, we would be able to manage our 
and uh, animal and human uh, health and well-being. And at the same time, we can prevent uh, climate uh, crisis or uh, definitely prevent our uh, biodiversity change as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ines and Tanu. Um, and also thank you to all our panelists and all our participants for being such an integral part uh, of this event. Your inputs have been hugely valuable. Uh, and I'm sure that all of these elements will um, constitute a stronger basis for the EU and India to design a cooperation roadmap on animal welfare. Uh, and I think this event really confirms that there is a lot of interest in this topic and there is a lot that both partners can learn from each other. Uh, so I think it's time for both partners to launch a comprehensive cooperation mechanism on animal welfare. And this could take the shape of a standalone uh, political dialogue or later of a dialogue under the future free trade agreement. Uh, the fields that we discussed today could be used as priorities for this cooperation and the EU and India could also explore the establishment of knowledge exchange uh, and capacity building programs to improve animal welfare practices and aim at upward regulatory alignment. Uh, the future EU-India free trade agreement should also serve to promote higher animal welfare standards. And this could be achieved by only lowering tariffs if high animal welfare requirements are respected and by including in the text strong and detailed provisions on animal welfare cooperation. Also, any discussions between the EU and India on antimicrobial resistance should take into account the link that exists between AMR and intensive farming and thus low animal welfare standards. The EU and India have a long tradition of caring for animals and they can act as leaders at a global level and set the trend for a needed transition towards an economy that respects non-human animals. I would like to also thank my co-host Reinika for this platform that serves as a strong and efficient base to make the world more aware of the importance of sinking trading relations with the welfare of human and non-human animals, so imperative for a better tomorrow for all of us.